tonight, an exclusive interview in the field with Canada's top soldier. The race is on to ensure that Ukraine gets the equipment, the training that is necessary. An inside look as Canadians help train on frontline first aid. Airports and passengers prepare for possible March break travel chaos. We expect it all to be ready and back to what it was before it's not. Chris Rock stands up and sounds off a year after that infamous Oscar slap. Oh, anybody that says words hurt has never been punched in the face. This is The National with Ian Hennemansing. We begin tonight with a rare look inside Canada's role in the war for Ukraine and an equally rare interview with this country's top soldier. It's happening as Canadian troops train Ukrainians soon to be sent to the front lines. With winter coming to an end, Ukrainian officials are worried about what may be a decisive spring as their troops struggle to hold back a Russian offensive. Far behind the front lines, David Common saw how Canadian know-how might play a part. This is not Ukraine's front line, but it is intended to replicate it. In the comparative safety of neighboring Poland, Canadian soldiers are teaching Ukrainian troops first aid under fire, a skill they will certainly use. We can't show you the Ukrainians' faces, nor disclose exactly where we are in Poland. But all the lessons here are based on real-time experiences from Ukraine's battlefield. As Russia rebuilds, the race is on to ensure that Ukraine gets the equipment, the training uh, that is necessary for it to be able to survive and, and be victorious as a, as a nation. Canada's top soldier only just left Ukraine, a secret weekend visit discussing the state of the battle following the donation of eight Canadian Leopard tanks plus artillery guns and ammunition, all coming from Canada's own military stock. I'm very concerned about uh, our state of readiness. Weapons needed by Ukraine, says General Air, but he says Canada needs replacements soon. Where there is a will, there is a way. And so we've got to rapidly increase our, uh, our, our, our timelines to be able to rearm ourselves uh, to face the challenges of the future. The defence minister has said new tanks will be purchased, but there's no indication of what kind or when, and it's regularly taken the federal government years to procure military equipment. Canadians may not be fighting in this war, but the conflict has made Canada's military much busier. Much of this training will be put to use very quickly because many of these Ukrainian forces are actually headed back to the front line, some in a matter of just days. David Common, CBC News in Western Poland. At one of those front lines, Ukrainian troops have been forced into a difficult situation. The risk of being trapped by Russian forces in the besieged city of Bakhmut is rising by the hour. Military analysts describe the struggle for the city as a brutal battle of attrition that may be entering its final stage. The Ukrainians say that the, the casualties have been disproportionately in favor of the Ukrainians, therefore more Russians being killed per Ukrainian, to be brutally frank. And so, but at some point, Ukrainians have to cut on that because they're going to be surrounded. The uh, Russians are doing a pincer movement. Uh, they have the city surrounded from three sides. The Ukrainians can still get supplies in and out, but very difficult. They've been giving everything they could to defend, but I think it's going to come soon that they're going to have to pull back. A Ukrainian withdrawal from Bakhmut would put Russia a step closer to conquering the entire region. That town must be taken from a Russian point of view. They have to take every town in the oblast. So they, they, Bakhmut is sort of on the road to that oblast boundary to the west. Ukraine has prepared new defensive lines to slow that march, an effort to buy time. All assessments right now suggest that the Ukrainians are not prepared. They don't have the strength to conduct an offensive operation until the spring. They're waiting for the latest wet wave of Western support, like the main battle tanks, the infantry fighting vehicles, the air defense systems, the artillery systems. This is all coming, and the Ukrainians are training for this. Which is what makes efforts like Canada's training mission in Poland so important for Kyiv. Relief workers are scrambling to help thousands of Rohingya refugees in Bangladesh tonight after a fire tore through their camp. Yeah. 
Flames raced through the settlement in the country's south, destroying huts. No reports of death or serious injury, but some 12,000 are without shelter. Over a million Rohingya refugees have fled persecution in neighboring Myanmar. Angry protests in Greece again today over that country's worst ever rail disaster. In Athens, thousands demanded better rail safety before some broke off to battle police. The unrest began Tuesday when 57 people were killed in the collision of a passenger train and a freight train. Today, a station master involved was detained on charges related to the crash. After nearly two decades, the United Nations has finally reached an agreement on how to protect the world's oceans. Susanna De Silva tells us what it means and what happens now. Ladies and gentlemen, the ship has reached the shore. After decades of discussion, it took one more marathon negotiation, 36 hours, for that ship to come in. Last night was a turning point, not just for the ocean, but actually for the future of our planet. And up until last night, there was no legal framework, there was no set of rules that would actually allow us to protect the incredible wildlife, the incredible biodiversity that lives out there. A new set of rules aimed at protecting 30% of the world's lands and oceans by 2030. The seas, a crucial part, given they cover two-thirds of the world and provide the majority of the air we breathe. And while countries like Canada have made efforts to protect their own waters, advocates say that has not been enough. The species don't care about jurisdictions and 200-mile limits, so we need to make sure that those same species that we're protecting in our waters are also protected outside. Experts say eyes will be on Canada. We're really expecting Canada to be one of the first countries to ratify this treaty. That's Canada's role now, is to lead the charge in making sure that countries everywhere put this, put this treaty into law. A new UN body will decide on proposals for areas that should be protected, a process that will still take years. Yasmin Skepins doesn't think people should wait. She cleans beaches daily and tries to inspire others to do the same. You can already make a difference now, just by doing little things, like even picking up a piece of garbage every day makes a huge difference. And she's hopeful this new deal will also make a difference. Susanna De Silva, CBC News, Vancouver. A BC woman has been found dead at a resort in Mexico and a Canadian man is being held in custody. Kiera Agnew's family says the 23-year-old arrived in Playa del Carmen with her boyfriend on Thursday. The next day, they were notified of her death. Police in Mexico have arrested a person they're describing as a foreign national. They say he's suspected of committing femicide, which is the targeted killing of a woman because of their gender. A warning tonight about e-transfers. An investigation by our Go Public team shows those transactions can be risky. As Erica Johnson shows us, even seeing someone send you cash online doesn't guarantee that it's safely in your account. And this is where he keeps his tools. Christine Mason sometimes sells her husband's power tools when he's done with them, like this grinder she posted online last fall. After creating the ad on Kijiji, someone says he'll pay 480 bucks, but will be coming straight from work, so no cash. 480 is... It's a lot to grab out of the bank and is e-transfer fine? And that's when I decided, um, sure. But after he leaves with the tools, she checks her TD bank account. No e-transfer, even though she'd set up auto deposit, a feature advertised as secure that allows funds to be directly deposited into an account. No security question needed. Can you give me anything to go on? When she calls TD, she learns someone had sent an e-transfer the night before, but before it got deposited, cancelled it. I, I, was, I was so shocked because, I mean, this is, this is um, put in place for our security. She's not the only one who's never heard of the risk. Wow, I didn't know that was a possibility. That's weird. Uh, That's I mean, messed up. I'm just finding out about this. That's a little disturbing. 
In a go-public test, customers from all the big banks and several credit unions sent e-transfers to accounts with auto-deposit set up. Bank customers were not able to cancel the e-transfer after hitting send. Some credit union customers, though, were able to cancel the e-transfer more than half an hour later. Wow, yeah, that is very tricky and something that should not be happening. This fintech expert says you got to see it to believe it. You're really not protected until like you've really seen that money settle inside of your account. After GoPublic contacted TD about Christine Mason's case, the bank gave her back the $480 she'd lost, calling it a goodwill gesture. Mason says, though, from now on, she's only e-transferring with friends and family. For all future sales, it's cash. Erica Johnson, CBC News, Vancouver. Our Go Public stories come from you. If you have a tip for the team to investigate, send an email to gopublic at cbc.ca. Many Canadians will be looking forward to March break, a more normal one perhaps, three years after the start of the pandemic. But after recent travel chaos, not everyone's in a hurry to book that ticket. All those who are may wonder what they're in for. Lisa Shing takes a look. A week out from March break and many Canadians are staying put. I'm not going to go anywhere, just going to hang out. No travel plans? No travel plans. Why not? Um, I think cost and getting time off work. We've been trying to avoid travel peak season. Not just cost and also the crowds as well at the airports. Some already off are staying closer to home, hoping to dodge crowds and rising costs. It's definitely easier. I mean, from Montreal to Billy Bishop is an hour flight and you're downtown and there's so much to do in the city. Many want to avoid this, the possibility of inclement weather, seemingly endless delays, lost luggage, like what happened over the Christmas holidays, then again earlier this weekend in Toronto. I literally haven't been able to speak to anyone in the airport to get any information. While travel isn't at pre-pandemic levels, it will be up over the next few weeks. Airports across the country say they're ready. Toronto's Pearson International is placing a hard limit on the number of flights during peak times, but no planned changes at Vancouver and Calgary's airports. Bring your patients with you because, you know, not only is it March break, but it's still winter. For flyers, a gentle reminder. We just all have to understand that the world has just completely changed with just human resources. We expect it all to be ready and back to what it was before it's not. That isn't good enough for some passenger rights advocates who say airlines should take more responsibility. The airlines are running too many flights too thinly. They don't have a resiliency plan. They don't have backup aircraft and crews like they should. Under federal rules, passengers are entitled to rebookings or refunds for lengthy delays or cancellations, but not always food and hotels, an issue that likely won't get resolved before families take off over the next couple of weeks. Lisa Shing, CBC News, Toronto. Well, let's bring in former Air Canada executive and aviation industry expert John Grattick. He's in Montreal. And John, do you think we're going to see the kind of mess that, that a lot of airports dealt with over the holidays? I hope not. I am crossing my fingers. I'm being cautiously optimistic that we will not have uh, the mess that we had either last summer or over Christmas. Um, hopefully Mother Nature plays along with us and keeps the snowstorms and all of the other stuff that winter is known for keep away from us. So even people who travel a lot have learned new lessons over the last year or so. You know, arrive extra early, use luggage trackers, be prepared to wait. Um, but you also suggest that people have a, a plan B or, or even a plan C. Tell us about that. Yeah, plan Bs and plan Cs really are alternatives that you would normally uh, look at trying to figure out where is it that you have as a backup to your operating to your planned operations. So if you have a trip that you're planning to Florida, you're going to Miami, I would say basically have a, an alternative trip in, the, uh, in your back pocket that you would probably pay a bit more to get, but book it and make sure that you have that plan in place because the odds are that the, uh, the plans do go awry and you want someplace to go. You don't want to stay home. We have just seconds left. Are you going to be flying during the busy March break period? No, sir. I'm staying home. All right. Thanks. Have a good one. Another train has derailed in Ohio just weeks after that disaster in East Palestine. 
This is the moment cars started jumping the track near Springfield. Initially, residents were told to shelter in place, but authorities later confirmed there weren't any hazardous materials on board and no risk to the public. This derailment took place about 350 kilometers away from the last one. Both trains were operated by the same company. U.S. conservatives and pundits are digesting the latest speech by Donald Trump. It came Saturday night at a well-known annual conference. CPAC used to be a place for candidates to test reaction to their messages. But as Katie Simpson shows us, the message now seems to be support Trump or bust. In this room, Donald Trump is viewed as the past, present and future of the Republican Party. No more is CPAC a mainstream conservative convention. This gathering is largely about re-electing the former president. I am your warrior. I am your justice. And for those who have been wronged and betrayed, I am your retribution. I am your retribution. We are so excited to be here. In Trump's loyal allies took center stage with speeches on extracting revenge for the 2020 vote. You Democrats, deeply personal attacks on political opponents and extremist positions on divisive cultural issues. Transgenderism must be eradicated from public life entirely. It's great to be back at CPAC. Trump challenger Nikki Haley tested out a competing message. If you're tired of losing, put your trust in a new generation. And if you want to win, not just as a party, but as a country, then stand with me. And for her efforts, Haley was heckled and mocked as she tried to mingle with the crowd. This is a party, I think, that is struggling to understand what it believes, and there's really, there's really a void of leadership. Tired of the drama, this conservative political organizer held a competing convention this weekend about a 20-minute drive north of CPAC. We are hoping to bring people together from around the country who want to put principles ahead of party or politicians. The reality is there is a belief here that the Republican Party must urgently break away from Trump and his style of politics in order to win general elections. If not, these leaders argue they'll keep losing. This is America, and you deserve, and I deserve, and every American deserves a better matchup than Joe Biden and Donald Trump. Katie, as Republicans try to figure out who their next presidential nominee is going to be, looks like the Democrats are going to get behind Joe Biden. Yeah, give an old magic eight ball a shake and it's all signs point to yes, Ian. It's not a matter of if Biden will run again, it's more about when he's going to actually make the announcement. A lot of Democrats are gritting their teeth through this. They're trying to be respectful, but at the same time, there is a lot of enthusiasm for the idea of a new, younger generation to get involved in leadership. Part of the problem, though, Democrats may not want Biden to run again, but there isn't an obvious successor, at least not yet. And of course, Biden has already shown that he can beat Trump. Ian. Thanks, Katie. In Iran tonight, a crisis is escalating over the suspected poisoning of schoolgirls. <laughs> These girls are describing the strange order they detected at school just as many of them became ill. Authorities have now acknowledged cases like this in more than 50 schools across the country. They started a couple of months after a wave of protests began, led in large part by women and girls. There's a renewed push in Parliament for the creation of a new form of accountability in potential cases of election interference. J.P. Tasker looks at requiring foreign agents to get registered. This former Conservative MP says he was a victim of a Beijing-backed disinformation campaign. The Chinese foreign interference is one of the contributing factors to my defeat. Bogus stories about him flooded Chinese social media in the 2021 election, including messages saying Chu, a Chinese-Canadian, wanted to suppress the community. Many of our diaspora uh, Canadian of Chinese descent uh, has been in the past manipulated by foreign uh, interests. Chu says he was targeted by the regime because he introduced this bill, which would force agents working on behalf of a foreign government to register their activities in Canada or face criminal penalties. We've seen how authoritarian regimes around the world have become more emboldened than ever. This conservative senator has picked up the fight after Chu's defeat 
pushing for legislation that would give police new tools to crack down on foreign meddling, saying failure to register is easier to prove than election interference. We have fallen way behind in charging people who are attempting to circumvent our democracy and our democratic institutions, and it's high time that the Trudeau government does something about it. Prime Minister Justin Trudeau has bristled at questions about Chinese influence. I'm pretty sure everything I've said over the past 20 minutes answered that question. It's a complicated space to legislate. But the Prime Minister's point person on the issue says Ottawa is open to a registry, something Canada's closest allies already have. I think we need to proceed expeditiously in that regard. We've obviously seen what a number of other countries have done. The government says it's launching consultations on the merits of a foreign agent registry. Critics maintain the time to act is now, saying the country needs to tamp down on Chinese interference before the next election. J.P. Tasker, CBC News, Ottawa. With just one week before the Academy Awards, Chris Rock addresses that infamous Oscars slap. Chris, they're ready for you. Does he deliver the blow he was hoping for? Anybody that says words hurt has never been punched in the face. <laughs> A weeks-long trek to raise reconciliation awareness. This is uh, very precious. <laughs> Why, for so many, the journey was so personal. You're going to fall for the guy with the abs and let the guy with personality get away. A lot of the jungle. From improv to screams around the world, Andrew Fung tells me how Kim's convenience changed everything. My mom's like, they're going to pay you to be on TV? We're back into. <laughs> Almost a year after he was hit while presenting at the Oscars, comedian Chris Rock has finally opened up about Will Smith and the slap in a comedy show aired live on Netflix. You gotta watch what you say, cause words hurt. You know, anybody that says words hurt has never been punched in the face. No names in that opening joke, but it was clear what Chris Rock was talking about. Uh-oh, Richard. <laughs> Oh, wow! Wow! This infamous moment at last year's Oscars. Apparently upset over a joke about his wife's hair, Will Smith hit Rock on live television. A shocking moment. Rock hasn't said much about it since then, until yesterday, with the release of his live Netflix special called Selective Outrage. In its final 10 minutes, he unloaded. Now, as Chris Rock fans know, he curses a lot and uses words we won't, so we can't just roll the content, but to paraphrase, Rock said the assault destroyed his lifelong admiration for a former friend. And he tore into Will and Jada Pinkett Smith's relationship, suggesting it was deeply toxic and likely the real cause of the incident. As for why he never retaliated, Rock said this. People from indigenous nations in Quebec have completed what they call the world's longest off-trail snowmobile expedition. They carried with them messages of hope and reconciliation. It all began two and a half weeks ago with the lighting of a sacred fire. Sarah Levitt shows us how it ended. A hero's welcome for the snowmobilers at the end of a trek across Quebec, nearly 4,500 kilometers. Called the First Nations Expedition, it was meant to unite different Indigenous nations across the province. The group also wanted to highlight issues like residential schools and missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls. For me, it's mission accomplished, one organizer said. Their journey began in mid-February in the Atikamekw community of Manuan. Over the next two weeks, their travels took them through Anishinaabe, Cree and Innu land, among others. Carole Dubé was one of the snowmobilers. His wife was Joyce Echequan, who was insulted and laughed at by nurses at a Joliet hospital as she lay dying, with a coroner concluding racism contributed to her death. We had some difficult times, Dubé says, but it's nothing compared to what children of residential schools had to deal with, what Joyce had to deal with. This is uh, very precious. Marilyn and Peggy Jerome were two of just seven women who took part in the group of about 50. We're just there in the land and we, we built a charm relationship, helping each other, sharing, and you know, just by 
having this dialogue amongst us. There were other benefits too. We gained uh, muscle that we didn't know we have some muscles. <laughs> we, we lost weight too. <laughs> It was a chance to raise awareness, yes, but also a healing journey for many as they traveled and took in the sights of the land. Sarah Levitt, CBC News, Montreal. After Kim's Convenience closed, Andrew Fung started a new TV family that run the burbs. Okay, we're all doing a chore. Mm -hmm. One, two, three. But I take him back to the place that changed everything. It's pretty surreal to be back in here. And the race to fix a wharf tied to people's livelihood. You wouldn't have imagined that the water could get that high and that the wind could get that high and, and do that. The National takes you deeper into the story shaping your world. Next. It's a broken. Falcock, the word. It's funny. <laughs> oh, hey. Hey. That's a funny. <laughs> He's known by many for his role as Kim Chi on Kim's Convenience. Now, Andrew Fung has taken that experience and his five Canadian Screen Awards and started his own show. Three, two, one, dance! Run the Burbs is a fresh take on the classic immigrant family narrative a show that's inspired by Fung's own experience, a son of immigrants who's now grappling with fatherhood himself, and all the laughs and lessons in between. One trip. Uh -huh. We put in work! Fung's story started in the suburbs of Calgary. When he unexpectedly fell in love with improv as a teenager, it's the city where he hustled to turn that passion into a real profession. Yeah. Andrew Fung has come a long way from those small stages in Calgary, the creative force behind a sitcom that's breaking new ground with its take on the modern Canadian family. Why are we doing this? This is family bonding time. Okay, we're all doing a chore. Mm -hmm. One, two, So Andrew, we're at Regency Palace restaurant in Calgary. This was uh, your suggestion. Why here? Because this place has been uh, an iconic place in my life, my whole life. Coming here for Saturday, Sunday dim sum with my parents, weddings here, uh, uh, grad parties here, uh, like junior high grad parties here. This place is, has been the center of it. And I think it's, 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 it's just home for me. Yeah. Oh, here it is. Yeah. Oh, this is it here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank there's you. some danger with me trying to eat this on camera, though, yeah. right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, there's a possibility with the, the, the sauce. But uh, yeah, this is one of my favorites growing up. I do crave it. So when I'm out in Toronto, this is what I look for. Um, so let's talk about uh, about your, your parents for a moment. You as the child of immigrants, what, what, what impact did that have? Huge impact. My parents worked opposite schedules. My mom would drop me off at like five in the morning at my grandparents' house, take care of me. She would go work at a cafeteria at a school and then pick me up uh, after school and then get, get me dinner to help me with my homework and then go back to work again at six o'clock. Then my dad, who was working all day, would come home at six o'clock and take care of me at night. I saw that struggle. My mom working two jobs as a server. My dad working at a metal fabrication shop. I've seen the growth. I saw the day my parents, my dad was able to, with another guy, leave and start their own business. I saw the day my mom opened up her own business, a flower shop in, in Forest Lawn. I've seen that growth. I've seen the Canadian dream. Um, and I saw the value of hard work. Thank you. And so you are living the classic immigrant son's story by doing comedy. I'm kidding. Yeah. Okay. 
<laughs> but it's it, it's 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 so great because I worked I went to go work for my dad at that metal shop when I was 14. Yeah. Uh, I might be breaking some labor laws there, but I went to go work there. My dad always told me, Andrew, money is hard to make. You got to work really hard for it. And I realized that coming home, you know, dirtied up from the grease and the metal, my hands hurt, tired. And he did that every single day. And so I recognize the value of hard work now. So there you are, a teenager in high school, like all of us trying to find your way in the world. And then you discovered improv. And from what I understand, for you, that changed everything. It changed everything. I started doing it when I was 16 uh, because our instructor, our teacher, a drama teacher, had hired an improv instructor for the week. She saved all this money. And we went down to the Loose Moose Theater Company and it felt so free. And she said, you can go do that. And I was like, I can? So that's when, it, that's when the love happened. That's when that light flickered, right? You're finding your path. And that's why I attribute so much of Calgary to amazing teachers. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm half Chinese, half Vietnamese. I'm a Calgarian born and raised. And I remember when I started, when I came out to audition for Kim's Convenience, Jean Yoon, who plays Amma, looked at me. She's like, wait, you're, you're, a, you're an Asian comedian from Calgary. And she just looked at me and said, how did you make it out? And it stunned me, because I guess that's perception outside of this province. The, the general consensus is you're not doing comedy in Calgary to make it. <laughs> you're doing it because you love it. So here we are in the Ironwood Stage and Grill, the old Gary Theater, your first time here for a long time. What memories does it bring back? I remember walking in here when it was the Loose Moose Theater, and in total there were about six or seven of us, and like most of us were Asian, and the Loose Moose had never seen so many Asian kids show up yeah. to take improv classes, so they called this the Asian Invasion. <laughs> and uh, I spent so much time here, and then the theater, uh, closed it was a really sad day and i haven't come in here since because it like hurt too much so it's pretty surreal to be back in here you loved improv but improv is tough like i've i'm just watching it there's some cringe worthy moments did you have any fails up on stage i i could i could talk about fails for hours so many fails probably the first four years of improv was all failing and really that's what improv taught me. Improvisation taught me to fail. Because when I started improvising, I was trying to be really good and trying to be funny. And by doing that, I was not good and not funny. But here, I remember my first failure, my artistic director, Dennis Cahill, said after the show, well, that wasn't a good show. <laughs> he said it, he was very blunt, he still is. And he said, well, you get to come back next week and try again. That was everything that, that I could fail and come back and try again. It's a picture of us. Oh, yeah. that's wonderful. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's so nice. Did you notice anything? Oh, you photoshopped mom out. <laughs> oh, dad, I thought that's what you wanted. No, that's exactly what I wanted, not what she wanted. <laughs> when did you feel confident enough that you were going to go all in with comedy? It was 2012. And I was the director of a nonprofit organization and I genuinely loved that job. And while doing that, it gave me time to do a lot of comedy. And I created this Excel spreadsheet and it categorized every single month. And at the very bottom was how much I was making at a job and very above was how much I was making as an artist. And there was a point where I'm like, oh, I made as much as an artist this month as I did at working my job. So I said, quit my job, go on after it. And I set up that Excel spreadsheet. And if ever I went under my job salary, I'd have to reevaluate my options. And there were months where I was down $50. And I'd like call around, try to book a gig, try to do a show, try to do a set, anything to get above that number. And I've never been under that number. And I still use that Excel spreadsheet. So on that spreadsheet, the number started to change, I guess, when, uh, when Kim's Convenience came along. <laughs> Yeah, uh, and I remember I showed my mom the contract of my mom of Kim's Convenience, and my mom's like, they're gonna pay you to be on TV? <laughs> hey, cover your shoulders! Sorry, what's going Good on? <sighs> Look, I can't help it if she's into me. Fine, Chung's the hot one, so go for it. What? 
I'm clean, I cooked, I love that story about your great grandmother who was suffering. She was a suffragette. Whatever, the point is, you're gonna fall for the guy with the abs and let the guy with personality get away. Law of the jungle. You think I drop a guy I like because a slightly more handsome guy is in the room? Slightly? You heard her. the essentials here we got the shrimp dumplings yes we got this uh beef uh rice crepe we got barbecue pork buns fantastic if you're feeling these oh my god you know i, I did you noticed i had more than my share no, that's I, why I, you're asking me I, that. Well, no, I, I am so happy because i look i can come back and order this anytime i'm not i'm not hoarding food well if that gives you joy i will give you joy <laughs> for the rest of this lunch let's talk about kim's convenience mm -hmm. and the huge success that that had and there you were a, a key part of, of the cast what impact did that experience have on you? Everything. It it put us in the spotlight in the center of it to work with that cast and tell that story that was so relatable. People coming up on the street telling you how, how the show changed their life. They felt seen for the first time. It was a joy making that show with that cast and telling that story. And I'm so thankful for that opportunity. So you go from a supporting role in that show to run the Burbs where you are the co-creator, executive producer, star, or one of the stars. Um, it, it's a show about adults who are the children of immigrants and now in turn are parents. Yeah. And so, and that's your experience. That is my experience. It is. You raise your, you raise, you raise your kids uh, as a parent with one foot in Canada and one foot in the country where your family is from. And sometimes you've never even been there, <laughs> you know, handed down traditions that you do. And you're like, why do we do this? And you're trying to like shape it. You're trying to do it. And I find that that wasn't reflected in our storytelling. Kim's convenience was the immigrant experience. But I always did wonder what would happen when Jung, Janet and Kimchi, when they have kids. Mm -hmm. And really, with this show especially, I want to tell the story and I want to like normalize families of color in the suburbs because we've been erased from the bit of the storytelling there. And so I, I carry that responsibility uh, with great importance. I care about it. I want to do good work. I want to make people laugh, but I want to do it and authentically represent this family and our community. A toast. It's that. And I am happy to celebrate today with our friends and our family. Looking forward to this delicious meal, all thanks to my talented wife, and spending more time with you, Mom and Dad. Chuk Mung Nam Mai. Happy New Year. Yeah. Yeah. My relationship with my kids is really open. I try to, I try, try, I'm trying to build emotional intelligence and strong relationship with my kids so that they feel like they can come to me with ever, whenever they need me. My parents see that and they're always like, your relationship with your kids is completely different than us. My dad made a comment one time. He's like, you, uh, you say I love you a lot to your kids. I'm like, I do. He's like, I didn't. I'm like, I know, <laughs> I'm aware, right? But then he, say, he did say, but you know I love you. I'm like, I know you love me. You know, I know you, I know you're proud of me. You discovered that the way they treated you kind of with discipline wasn't because there wasn't that love there. It's oh. because they felt that's what they had to do. It's what they had to do. They were working two jobs and they were working opposite schedules. They were just trying to make sure I had a good, they, were, they had a good kid, you know? And we talk about all the sacrifices that immigrant parents make and, and honestly, all parents make mm -hmm. for their kids. Mm -hmm. That's it, yeah. right there. They're just trying, they're just, I realize this now, I was watching my parents grow up. And that's something I forget. Yeah. Because when I raise my kids, I'm just trying my best and I'm growing up and I don't know what I'm doing. They didn't know what they were doing. They were just trying their best. They were two young kids growing up, yeah. you know? 
Um, but as my parents get older and they worry about me less, I'm seeing the, those proud parents. Like I remember my mom was like, they were, they, they wanted me to have a good job. But when I told my mom I wasn't gonna be a lawyer, she cried, <laughs> she cried. And then um, uh, when they saw me succeeding in acting, they loosened up and they connected to it. And then when Kim's Convenience hit, my mom would walk around a plane and tell people, hey, my son is on Kim's Convenience, can you please watch it? She's so proud now. And so um, as a child, I feel like that's, I'm so happy I've been able to, to, to give that to my parents, this feeling that they, they, they can like relax now. You're still not a lawyer. I'm still not a lawyer. <laughs> I'm still not a lawyer. Though the day I get to play a lawyer will be pretty interesting. <laughs> will be very exciting, yeah. One of the interesting things about comedians, people who write comedy, are their insights, and there were so many there, not just about making a show and growing up as a you know child of immigrants, but also the idea that you realize when you become an adult that your parents were still figuring things out, even as they were young parents. You're looking at another impressive Canadian at only nine years old. She's headed into the record books. How does she do it? That's in our moment, but first. The wharf that helps keep a roof over many people's heads destroyed by Hurricane Fiona. Now the rush to get it fixed before the start of the fishing season. That's next. The clock is ticking in a PEI harbor community that depends on lobster to make a living. As the season looms, a wharf damaged by Fiona's hurricane force winds is still in bad shape. Kate McKenna shows us how people will have to adapt. This will not be easy to fix. Fiona made a mess of this harbor. But lobster season starts next month, so the race to rebuild is on. If we don't have this wharf, it's going to be kind of uh, chaos around here. This small section will be ready for fishing season, a stop gap before bigger repairs. When this wharf is fixed, uh, everyone's gonna have to get along and just tie up beside other people that never tied up before. Fishing sustains this village. What happens at the harbor affects almost everyone. Redhead would be like a large factory in an urban center or uh, a big sawmill in a small town in BC. Some 150 harbors in Atlantic Canada were affected. Ottawa earmarked millions to fix the unprecedented damage. I never saw anything like that. You wouldn't have imagined that the water could get that high and that the wind could get that high and, and do that. But it's not just a matter of rebuilding the existing wharf. The plan is to change the design so that it's more resilient in the face of future storms. Extreme weather events like this will become more frequent and severe. So harbors will need to be rebuilt to withstand those conditions. Part of the plan includes rebuilding wharves to be four feet taller. Four feet higher would have stopped the waves, the water coming over the wharf from the opposite direction, yes. And the boats would have been a little more secure. It's a good idea. Um, we'll have to adapt the way that we use the wharf in the same way that the wharf needs to be adapted to the new climate reality. Five months on, this harbor is proof. Maritimers live with Fiona's scars, putting a sharper focus on the need to plan for stronger, more unpredictable storms. Kate McKenna, CBC News, Morrell, Prince Edward Island. Next to nine-year-old sets, not one, but three world records doing this. Stop. <laughs> You'll meet the hula hoop master in our moment. One, two, three, go. This is the moment Mama the Venoth set a world record for, well, what you're looking at, hula hooping, and it's just one of three records she had set that day. She's just nine years old. It's an activity Mama the has been doing since she was just a toddler, and she's so good, Guinness invited her to set the records at their headquarters in London earlier this year and set them she did, one after another after another. Tonight, her triple triumph is our moment. Stop. 
I was really amazed and happy because I never knew I would reach a big level of actually going to United Kingdom to the headquarters to perform uh, records. It was my really proud moment. One of the really hardest one was doing peacock scale and doing those lovely for the knees. It was really hard because I had to balance and take my whole leg on top of my head. Normally I would finish my schoolwork first and then after like that I would start practicing for two hours. Actually, she'll be feeling a little bit dizzy by the end of the day. When I grow up, I really want to reach the Olympics in uh, rhythmic gymnastics. She wanted to achieve more, more, more. She wanted to go to the next step. So we are really so proud of her. And so her dream is, and she was talking about it there, going to the Olympics. There's not hula hooping in the Olympics, at least not yet, but that she loves dancing and she loves hula hooping and she loves gymnastics. So rhythmic gymnastics, which is an Olympic sport, seems like the perfect blend. That is The National for March 5th. Thanks for being with us. Have a good night.